Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy World Oceans Day. Welcome to another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. Uh, today is all about celebrating our oceans, bringing some of the world's leading scientists, explorers, and conservationists into classrooms to share the wonder of our oceans and why we need to protect them. So my name is Joe Gorevsky. I'll be your host for today, and I'm very excited to welcome Rob Stewart. Uh, Rob's an award-winning biologist, photographer, conservationist, and filmmaker behind two phenomenal documentaries, Sharkwater and Revolution. He was born and raised in Toronto, in Canada. He began photographing underwater at 13, and by 18 he was a scuba instructor. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree uh, in biology and spent four years as chief photographer traveling the world for Canadian Wildlife Federation magazines. So um, leading remote expeditions, he's logged thousands of hours underwater, he uses some of the best camera technology, even rebreathers, um, so circulates his air and can stay down longer. His images are highly sought after. His films have won many awards ar uh, around the world, um, drawing attention to things like shark finning and what we're doing to our oceans. So Rob, it's an absolute pleasure to have you joining us on Oceans Day today. All right, so um, we have classrooms joining us from across North America. Um, Rob's going to share a little bit with us, and then from there we're going to go to Q&A. We'll get to each classroom at least once, and that's probably what time will allow today. So Rob, I'll let you take over for a bit. Oh, Rob, we lost your volume. Let me see. Rob? Oh, well that's peculiar. We were just talking, so I don't know what could have changed in the last couple of seconds. Oh, he might know. Ah, uh, headset. Rob, we still don't have you back. Huh. Um, what we could try is switching browsers or logging out and coming back in. I don't know why it would have just dropped out on us though because we were just perfect a second ago. But if you want to try following the link again, I can entertain the classrooms for a minute until you get back. So there you go, the wonders of technology. We can connect all across the country, all across North America. And then right when we hit play, something will, will go wrong on us. So Rob will pop right back in in a moment, and uh, we'll continue things. Um, here he comes again. Hey, Rob. How about now? That's better. I don't know what happened, but you're back. Okay. So. There we go. Hi. Um, so I'll, I'll launch into it. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. It's technology. Um, Technology, yeah. Thanks for participating in Ocean Day, everybody. Thanks for um, some of you may have seen Sharkwater. Say if you did or Revolution. Thanks for watching it. Um, I think we're in a really beautiful time on this planet right now, where we have a suite of challenges that are perfectly suited to our skill sets. And I think the reason why we feel for these animals, and the reason why movies like Sharkwater, The Cove, anything. Uh, hits us emotionally is that we care for a reason. We have these emotions because this stuff's important. You know, we depend on the oceans to survive. We depend on life. It's life that gives us our food, our water, and our air. And what Sharkwater did after um, the movie came out, government policy changed around the world. Shark finning is banned throughout pretty well everywhere right now. Conservation groups were changed. And that proved something pretty beautiful to me, that we'll do the right thing if we know what's going on. And, and that means something about humanity, that we're good, we just don't know what's going on a lot of the time, and that information will change the world because information engages our morals, and because of that we hold ourselves accountable, we hold our friends and our family accountable, and eventually change governments, change laws, and change behaviors, and, and that can have a massive impact. And today we sit in a, you know, in a pretty precarious predicament. If, if you were to just look at the environmental crises that we face, particularly with the oceans, you, you might look into the future and think, humanity is in serious trouble, and in many ways we are. You know, 90% of the big fish in the oceans are gone. The oceans are 30% more acidic than they were 100 years ago. And acidified oceans and changing ocean chemistry has caused 
four out of the five mass extinctions in the last 500 million years that wiped out life, including the extinction that ended the reign of the dinosaurs. So we're doing a lot of damage to this planet, but I think a lot of the reason why we're doing it is because we don't know what's going on. We're unaware of the impacts of our behaviors. We're unaware of the destruction wrought by um, by, by the setup of, of a corporate world where we're involved in growth. But if you were to understand that information changes the world, that as soon as people understand a problem, that an issue gets brought into the spotlight, our morals engage, we feel for something. The greatest predictor of human behavior is the expectations of our peers. So as soon as your friends and your family expect you not to use a straw because straws end up in the ocean, as soon as they expect you not to eat a top predator from the ocean, you're probably going to do that because you can feel that expectation because we're all, you know, really one family on this planet. So looking into the future, I think we have a massive opportunity. You're the first generation in history that knows exactly what you need to do with your life. You know, the careers that were brought to your parents were boring and mundane and, you know, they needed fast cars and golf because the lives were boring. You know, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, and not that there's problems with any of those professions. But now you have an opportunity to be a hero, to fight for ecosystems, to save species, to make this world a brighter place. And because we're in this predicament where almost everything's going to have to change within your lifetime, you can create your own career. You can take what you're most passionate about, you can take the animals you love the most, the ecosystems you want to save, or the good you want to do in the world, and put them together into a life of massive meaning. Uh, and that's that's amazing. No no generation has ever had that opportunity. So for for me, what we're focusing on right now is instead of fighting against the problems, which seem to strengthen them, we need to imagine and create a world that we would like to fight for instead. So part of the problem with us uh, doing battle with these environmental issues. We're fighting fishing industries, we're fighting deforestation, we're fighting climate change, and, and by doing that, we, we kind of become radicals and underdogs, but I think the greatest task of this generation right now, it's not just to save ecosystems or save species, but it's what could we do, how could we make this world beautiful for all species? What if we had a higher ambition? What if we decided to make this world amazing? What if we restored the rivers and the lakes? What if we brought forests back? What if this world was teeming with life? Wouldn't that be awesome? If there was animals everywhere, if there was plant life everywhere, people would not be hungry because there would be food in abundance. You could go to the rivers and the lakes for fish and food if you wanted to. And I think that's the most important thing that we need to be tackling at this time is, is particularly for you, is what kind of a future do you want to be heading towards? You want to head towards a world where things are difficult, people are starving, animals are going extinct, or do you think we as a species are smart enough and engaged enough and we have enough media and we've got billions of people connected on social media that we could create a world that's beautiful and amazing? And I think by doing that, we can very much leapfrog over the current environmental problems that exist today. So working in the oceans, we're currently making another movie. And the movie we're making is a, is a sequel to Sharkwater. It's very much Sharkwater 2. Uh, and it'll come out in about a year's time. And the reason we're making this film is because the situation has changed with sharks. It started out with sharks just being killed for shark fin soup. Um, but right now we're killing even more sharks than ever before. And their sharks are turning up in, in dishes and items that we're entirely unaware of. So sharks are turning up in cosmetics, like lipstick and moisturizer. They're killing deep sea sharks, some sharks that live thousands of meters below the surface, for their livers, and using those livers to make uh, makeup and cosmetics. Sharks are also turning up in pet food, dog food, cat food. They're turning up in fertilizer to fertilize our crops. And they're also being renamed things like flake and rock salmon and ocean whitefish and fed to us in fish and chips, in fast food sandwiches, um, and in uh, fish sticks. So we don't know that we're eating sharks. Because eating sharks is a radically different thing than eating other fish. Some other fish you could be eating 
have thousands of babies. You know, they mature very fast. They, they, they've evolved recently. We're eating sharks is like eating a dinosaur super predator that's really important for our survival. So with these industries renaming shark and misleading you, it lets you do damage to the planet without knowing it. So there's a campaign that's going to be launching uh, probably in about two weeks called Shark Free, which you guys should get involved with if you can. And it's about getting shark out of our sandwiches, out of our food, and out of our cosmetics and pet food. Because it's crazy that we're eat, eating and killing one of the oldest, longest lasting, most important predators the planet has for the sake of pet food and fertilizer. So next time you're in a grocery store and you look at you know, fish sticks, read the, read the label and see what's in there. And if there's something called flake or rock salmon or even ocean whitefish, that could be shark. So if you do, take a picture of it, post it on social media, and, and hashtag shark free, because we're going to need your help to get corporations and companies to identify where sharks actually live. So I'm going to open it up to questions in a sec, but I just want to thank you all for listening to me. It's a big, complex issue, but it's, uh, it's a massive opportunity for you to live lives of profound meaning. So I'm really excited to tell you about all this stuff. All right, Rob, thanks so much. I, I always love hearing your message because so much that we hear is about, you know, what's happening because it's, you know, the media likes to show the bad. It is good to hear that there are people doing things, that there is some hope and that we really are a generation right now growing up that does have so many opportunities to turn things around. So I thank you very much for sharing that message. And on a second note, I absolutely can't wait for the new film. Um, I'm going to introduce our classrooms very quickly, and then I'll let uh, each one have a turn. So we've got Mr. Turner in Thunder Bay, grade 5 class in Ontario. We have Mrs. Milton in Stevensville, grade 6 class. Mrs. Uh, Simone Sioni is in Kelowna, BC, the grade 7 class. We've got Mrs. Deason in grade 3 with uh, her classroom in Surrey, BC. Mrs. McLaren is joining us with a variety of students, I believe from grades 3 to 5 in Orangeville, Ontario, and Mrs. Smith Bischoff is joining us uh, from Bowmanville, Ontario. So let's get a microphone turned on. Let's start with our group in Kelowna. Your microphone is on. Um, have you ever been scared of a shark before when you're swimming with one? One of my kids wants to know. Have I ever been scared of a shark? Yep, for sure. Um, so I, I, I've been swimming with sharks since I was a kid. Uh, and what I figured out early on was that they're really sophisticated animals that aren't interested in eating people. And the reality is you're ten times more likely to be killed by a pig than you are to be killed by a shark. But to film sharks and to get the best footage possible and to bring people uh, a new relationship with sharks, we've, we've been swimming with all the species, the big ones, you know, and, and you don't really swim with cages because cages are for television um, and you can't film with a cage in the way. And sometimes they'll sneak up on you. Um, and they're really sophisticated and they're fast and they're, they've been designed for 400 million years to do just that, to sneak up on things. So you can be sitting there filming you know, a shark here and think you, you know what's going on and turn around and there's like a two foot wide face right there, sitting there like inches from your mask and that can be very unnerving. Um, so there's been times I've been afraid for sure but it, it, the fact that I'm alive and I'm still here and I've got all my limbs is kind of a, an indication that they're not really interested in eating us and it's very, very rare for a shark to, to try to bite somebody even in situations like that. All right, Mrs. Milton, I'll turn your microphone on if you guys have a question for Rob. What can students and teachers do to make a difference? What can students and teachers do to make a difference? Well, first realize you have a massive power to change the world, as big as your parents do, um, maybe even more so. Uh, so wield that power every way you can. Um, we made a movie called Revolution, our second film, which showed a bunch of kids uh, changing the world and getting shark fin banned in their territory. And right now, um, if, if sharks are uh, an important issue for you, one thing your class could do, one thing a group of you could do is, is talk to your government, talk to your parents, talk to everybody and say, I want shark fin banned in this city. It's crazy that you're allowed to buy and sell 
fins from you know the most endangered super predators the planet has, predators that control the ecosystem we depend on for survival. So I believe in the next five years we're going to live in a world where a shark fin is banned and you're not allowed to sell it, you're not allowed to trade it. So if that's an important issue to you, I'm 100% confident that each of you could get shark fin banned in your city. And the way the, the strategy for that is, um, if you visit our website, finfree.org, um, there's a bunch of tools there to show you how to make this happen. But it starts with, host a screening of shark water. Um, show it to your friends, your family, your community, as many people as you can. And then um, find somebody in the government, in, in your local level of government, and tell them you want shark fin banned. They can introduce a bill, a piece of government policy, and then all it's going to take is you pushing it. You know, talking to your friends, getting petitions signed, getting people um, into the government office when they vote on that to make sure. And, and look at these adults and say, look, I want a future. I, I want a future where I can survive on a healthy planet. I want a future with sharks. And it's really difficult for adults to, to argue with that. So you can take that blueprint in, in almost any kind of situation that you want um, and, and use that. The world, the world is designed for you to change it. Uh, you just have to get engaged and figure out how to do it. All right, great question. Uh, Mr. Turner, Thunder Bay. All right. First of all, Rob, I would like to say uh, it's an honor to hear you speak today. Um, I've been showing my classes uh, Revolution for the past three years now. Um, and to hear you speak today and the message that you have for the youth is amazing. Um, Fable's going to ask a question really quick here. In her, in her shark suit. In her shark suit. Yes. That's awesome. If you could change anything about your documentary revolution, what would you change? I would get more people to see it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, if I could change anything about it, so... Making movies is kind of hard. It's kind of hard, and when, when you make a movie like that, it's a very personal thing. It, it, it's a story that you're telling people, and you hope that that story makes sense to people, and it moves their hearts and moves their minds, and that they're going to want to see it. And getting people to see Revolution was more difficult than getting people to see Sharkwater. I think for two reasons. One, because Sharkwater was about a problem over there. It was about a problem in Asia people consuming shark fins, um, what was harming the oceans. But revolution is about us. It's about our consumption. It's about you know, us as a species. And I think that was more difficult because when people learn about, about some of that stuff, it might impose a bit of a moral burden on them. You know, they might have to change their behavior because of it. So if I was to change one thing, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would change anything about how the movie sits, what's in it, what's said in it, but I would... I would find a way to get billions of people to see that. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks for your message. It's awesome. Thank you. All right. Great questions and great shark suit. Uh, Mrs. McLaren, and your microphone's on in Orangeville. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. What a privilege to hear you speak, and we are looking forward to seeing some of your documentaries. Um, we have Josh that has a question, but we had another question about 360-degree cameras, and one of our students was wondering if you... Uh, have ever used one before? Uh, good. You want me to? Oh, yeah. I uh, we have not used 360 degree cameras yet, but we will um, while we're making shark water too to put people um, in Cocos Island underwater with schooling hammerhead sharks, so you can sit on this undersea volcano and look around and be surrounded by them. Okay, maybe we'll send you some footage then of something that one of our students is messing around with. <laughs> okay, Josh has a question. Thank you for that. How long does it take to make a documentary? It takes a long time. Um, Sharkwater took four years, Revolution took four years, and we're making Sharkwater 2, I think, in about a year and a half. I hope. Fingers crossed. Um, they take a long time and uh, are big, big labors of love. All right. Good question. Uh, Mrs. Smith Bischoff, your quest, your microphone should be on now. How many types of sharks have you seen? How many types of sharks have I seen? Well, there's about a thousand species of sharks and rays in the world, and I've probably seen 50 or 75 different species. Just a small fraction of them. Well, my first answer to that would be lucky. 
I'm at about <laughs> 11 or 12, so 50 to 75 is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Um, let's see. To our other class joining, you're just, unfortunately, your microphone is just off of, oh, there we go. Mrs. Thiessen, if you don't mind turning your microphone on and asking a question, it's, it's your turn. Nice hat. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Um, Rob, how long have you been researching sharks? I've been researching sharks since I was your age, so uh, oh. probably probably 30 years, maybe. Um, I started studying sharks in school when I was 18, um, so that would be 17 years. Um, and I started taking pictures of sharks 20 years ago, so quite a long time. All right, well, we do have a couple minutes before the Hangout wraps up, so I'm going to revisit a couple of our classrooms and give them a chance to see if they have another question. So, Mrs. Milton, go ahead. Your microphone's on. Can you try that again? We missed that one. What shark is the closest to becoming extinct? What shark is the closest to becoming extinct? We were just in the Bahamas filming a type of shark called an oceanic white tip shark, and they were once the most abundant big predator on the planet. They were everywhere, but because they live in the open ocean, uh, far from shore, they're really easy for fishermen to catch, particularly in international waters where there's no regulations. And their populations in places like the Gulf of Mexico have dropped 99%. So I think they're pretty close. All right, great question. Mrs. Simona Sony, your microphone is on again. Uh, what gave you the passion to start saving sharks and protecting sharks? What gave me the passion? Um, so I loved sharks ever since I was a kid. Sharks were like dragons and dinosaurs, but they were real. And I just thought they were the coolest. So I started studying them, looking for them, hanging out with them, and then I, I was trying to become a wildlife photographer and thought that taking pictures of animals was, was what I wanted to do with my life. And I was in the Galapagos Islands photographing one of my favorite sharks, hammerhead sharks. And if you've seen Sharkwater, you actually kind of saw this, this incident which changed my life. Instead of finding sharks in all their majesty in this protected marine reserve, I found a fishing line that would stretch from Earth to outer space with thousands of baited hooks and hundreds of dead sharks. And it was that moment that I realized, you know, my favorite species in the world are getting killed and I have to do something about it. And then from that point on, I was trying to figure out how I could do something about it, what I could do, and what would have the greatest impact. All right. Another good question. And, um, yeah, it's a very powerful moment in, in shark water. You're in the Galapagos and, and pulling in that line and just... Uh, miles and miles of those lines. It is unfortunate. Mr. Turner, your microphone is on. First of all, Rob, I'd just like to say that um, we live in Thunder Bay, Ontario, on the shores of the largest body of fresh water in the world. And um, we, too, experience, it's not an ocean, but we experience a great deal of pollution and the things washing up on our shore here. Um, and I challenge my students every day to uh, help clean that up. And if you're ever in the neighborhood around Thunder Bay, we welcome you to our beautiful city here. Um, one student's going to ask a question right now, and it's Noah. Come on, Noah, hurry up. Just hop over, Noah. Hop over this. Quick. Hop over. There you go. Ask the question. What is your favorite type of shark? What is my favorite type of shark? My favorite type of shark is a great hammerhead shark. They're the biggest species of hammerhead. They eat other sharks. They've got huge sensory systems on their snouts. They're amazing. Um, and one comment about living in Thunder Bay and experiencing a fair bit of pollution on those waterways, um, I think pollution is, is something of the old world. I think in the future, we're going to look back on a time like this with astonishment. We're going to look back and say, you, you put pollution into the waterways? You put pollution into the air? You, you poison this world? I think our world in the future is going to be poison-free. Pollution is going to be illegal. Dumping waste and contaminants into our environment is going to be illegal. So as, as you imagine the future you're headed towards, 
please consider that and consider how your genius might help contribute to that kind of world. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Okay, great question and good choice. I was in Bimini recently um, in March with the, with the great hammerheads. We got to spend six hours uh, over several dives on the bottom with them. It was just, yeah, I oftentimes can just see it, just the moving over top and coming in front. It's just amazing experience. So anybody out there, if you can get down to Bimini, I highly recommend a little time with the great hammerheads. Um, and maybe one more. So let's check Mrs. McLaren's group and see if they uh, have one more question. We do. Trevor has a question. Do you know anybody who has been close to bit by a shark? I do know people that have been bitten by sharks, for sure. Um, a few of them. Um, sometimes that people do some pretty stupid things with sharks. Um, sometimes people will try to feed sharks, and, and the shark, instead of biting the fish, will bite the person's hand. Um, sometimes when they're holding shark uh, food out like this and waving it in the air, the shark might think that they're getting something and, and close in on the shark. I met someone who had been bitten in the leg by a shark. Um, yeah, I've, I've met a few. Um, just because I've been in the shark world for, for so long, people you know people surface and people come into our world. But everybody that has been bitten by a shark, they're really clear about it. They say, you know, it's not the shark's fault. The shark didn't try to eat me. I made a silly mistake. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was in murky water. I was there at sunset. I was in an area where sharks hunt. And the fact that these people are around to talk to me about it, and they still have most of their body with them is a testament to the fact that sharks don't want to eat people. If a big, big fish, if a big shark with massive teeth and huge power in the ocean wanted to eat you, it would eat you. It wouldn't just, you know, bite and then realize it made a mistake and let go. Yeah, that's an excellent point. There's, with millions of people in the water every day, if sharks were actually hunting people, I think there'd be a lot more. Um, a lot more cases happening than, than what we do have. So, Rob, maybe I'll give you a last word and then we'll sign out for today. It's been, an, again, an absolute pleasure for you joining us on World Oceans Day. We have about five more hours of hangouts to go. It's been a crazy day since six in the morning, um, reaching out all over the world. It was great to have you involved and sharing your story because both Sharkwater and Revolution, um, they're two movies that every student needs to see and really their parents too. <laughs> yeah, their parents as well. Well, thank you all for having me. Thanks, thanks Joe, for putting this on. Thanks to every classroom for your, your amazing and thoughtful questions. Um, if I was to close with anything, I would just close with, um, with, with remembering that this is a massive opportunity um, and that you know, despite the situation sometimes looking grim and despite it, it being sad, you know, don't get sad about it, just spring into action. The world needs you more than ever before. So, you know, be all you can be. Be the best person you can. Step up and, and fight for a world that's, uh, that's more beautiful than the one we have now. And hopefully within your generation, we can make something amazing. Okay, Rob, thanks for those words. I'm going to turn the microphones on really quickly. So, class, and class say goodbye and thank you. All right. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the World Ocean Day. Thanks for sharing some of it with us. And, Rob, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. We're logging off.